Good morning. Uh, at this time, we'll call to order the Board of County Commissioners meeting for Thursday, October 26. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Schaefer? Here. Commissioner Allen? Here. Commissioner Clicka? Here. Commissioner Osterhaus? Here. Commissioner Ashcraft? Here. Commissioner Brown is absent. Chairman Eilert? Here. We do have a quorum present. Would you join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would ask uh, those who are present if you have a noise-making device, uh, if you could turn it to silent mode or off so as not to uh, interfere with our electronic communications. Uh, we do have uh, uh, two or three um, special presentations to note this morning. We'll do so at this time. Could you join me at the podium this morning? Uh, we do have a uh, special recognition in regards to our Pillars of uh, Performance program. And uh, I'm going to ask the uh, county manager to uh, speak to that and uh, introduce us to uh, the individual or those who were involved in this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Commissioners, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with this today, we are talking about our pillars of performance. As you know, we come to you on a regular basis to talk about the culture we're trying to create in the organization, uh, which talks about doing the right thing for the right reason for the public good, but also trying to go ahead and talk about ongoing and collaborative efforts that allow us to go and be more efficient and effective in our delivery of services. Today, we're recognizing uh, two individuals with the uh, Human Services Department, that exemplify the activity, uh, Rick Gelbach and Rochelle Povivas. Uh, but before I talk about their activities and introduce them, I want to show you a short video about what they've done. Somebody has a great idea. 
My role in that is to empower them and encourage them to do that. So it, it truly was a no-brainer. It's like, yeah, run with it. Go do it. It's a Pillars of Performance success story showing Johnson County values at work. So if I got a, a Rick and Rochelle come up here, that'd be great. And Debbie, do you want to make a few comments as well? Yeah. It might be helpful, but at least Rick. And I had a chance, so we've had a, we had Norway, our United Way campaign commissioners. So this year, one of the uh, one of the prizes is that the area of, of uh, the portfolio that raises the most money gets to gets me, I guess maybe it's an anchor, uh, to go out and work with them for a day. And so this year I had a chance to go and work with uh, with Rick, and it was very entertaining to go around and kind of visit uh, uh, house and kind of do the measurements and so forth. It was quite an experience. Uh, so he does a lot of work. Deb, please go ahead. Okay, Debbie Collins with the Human Services Department. I don't have anything prepared. Um, thanks, Honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say um, that I, I am an enormously proud of both Rick and Rochelle. This initiative, while it seems like a little tiny minor thing, has really developed into a kind of a, a community-wide effort. Um, people in law enforcement use these little business cards, MedAct hands them out. Um, so it all started with an idea that Rick had, and Rick and and Rochelle working together um, and my role in it as I said in the video was just to get out of their way so I just want to again thank Rick and Rochelle for their their initiative their ingenuity their creativity and and really ultimately their um, commitment to the people that we serve so thank you well thank you very much anything either of you would want to say you're not done yet. You're not done yet. Stay here. Uh, no, th uh, thanks, guys, for uh, continuing the uh, the program that we've uh, tried to emphasize over the last several years, and that's uh, uh, being more than just an employee who comes to work, but looks at the operation uh, of uh, this particular department and other departments and see if there's something that can't be done to uh, assist those that we, uh, that we serve. So thank you very much. Thanks. And next, I'd like to ask Robin Hines and uh, those who are with her to uh, join me at the uh, podium. Don't hold back, guys. <laughs> we have a, a special uh, recognition award to uh, present this morning, uh, Achievement of Excellence in uh, Procurement. Uh, the Achievement of Excellence in Procurement recognizes the uh, organizational excellence in public and nonprofit procurement policies. The award criteria are designed to uh, measure innovation, uh, professionalism, uh, productivity, and leadership attributes of the procurement effort. Johnson County is one of only three counties in the state of Kansas to receive this award and recognition and only 48 counties of the 3,000 plus across the country have received this award. And uh, on top of all of that, this is the 10th consecutive year that Johnson County has received this award and recognition. So Robin, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good job. Sure. Thank you. Good thank job. You. And This is heavy. <laughs> it will hurt your yes, foot. It is. <laughs> so, would you like to say something, Robin? Thank you. Well, good morning, Chairman Eilert and Commissioners. I'm Robin Lines, Purchasing Manager. It's my pleasure to announce the purchasing team to you today. We have Dale Bauer, Senior Purchasing Administrator, Larry Allen, Purchasing Administrator, John Booth, 
purchasing administrator, and Amy Valerie, purchasing administrator. As commissioners, or as the chairman said, this is the 10th year that the Johnson County purchasing team has received the achievement of excellence in procurement. Some of the criteria that are on the application for receiving this award are having an ethics policy and practices in place, use of electronic procurement, such as online bidding and electronic processing of purchase orders. So the county utilizes Oracle Enterprise Business Suite for processing um, purchase orders, and we implemented the Ion Wave electronic bidding system in 2016. We have professionally certified staff. Um, staff have done presentations at conferences and seminars. So staff this year did a presentation on job order contracting at the National IPA Vendor Summit. Um, we were also a lead agency, which is one of the criteria for a cooperative procurement. We did that on the Metro-wide vehicle bid. And continued pursuit of excellence. So the purchasing department continually looks for ways to be innovative and a leader in public procurement. I would also like to highlight in September, the county held a vendor outreach where we had over 100 vendors that came and spoke with departments and agencies. And with that, I would like to thank the board for the presentation of the AEP award. Okay. Well, Robin, thank you very much for your leadership and the good work uh, that uh, your folks do. Thank you very much. Next time, I'm going to ask uh, Sheriff Calvin Hayden to uh, join me at the podium for uh, uh, a special announcement, special recognition, and uh, some great news. Sheriff, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Good to see you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I want to introduce you to uh, Chris Dominguez and uh, Dan Lawrence. Um, these two gentlemen are our last 59 and 60 officers to be hired. Um, to completely staff the Sheriff's Department. Um, we're very proud of them and it's been a team effort as you can tell everybody sitting here from uh, our personnel to our training to uh, our HR partners, uh, Susan and Jason, um, have done a fantastic job in helping us out. It's the first time that I can remember during the Sheriff's Office, during my career, and it's a pretty long one, um, um, that we've ever been completely fully staffed and it has taken a tremendous effort by everybody. It was truly, it was amazing because this time last year after I got elected, as you know, yep. I was really worried about what we were gonna do. So I was losing sleep. And uh, Hannes um, asked uh, Under Sheriff Bedford and I to go to a, uh, a class and it was a, a high performing organization, sent us to Virginia. And it impacted us in a tremendous way. And basically what it taught us was get out of the way get out of the way, just as you guys saw with this uh, situation, get out of the way and let people do their job. And literally that's what we did. We removed every obstacle we could get out of our, our officers' ways. And uh, it's not just our officers though. It's, it's been the county, it's been county HR, it's been um, our civilian staff, um, everybody coming together for a, a united cause. And I'm so proud of them, I could just almost bust. They're just <laughs> awesome. Well, great. Well, Sheriff, I know, uh, don't go too far away. Uh, you know, staffing issues in, uh, in public safety uh, have, been, have been a challenge for several years. And so uh, there's, uh, you know, besides the, uh, the overall public safety uh, aspect that we're able to offer our citizens, uh, there's also some other uh, budgetary aspects involved. Well, yeah. And uh, so we look forward to this full staffing uh, on, 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 on both issues, uh, making, uh, making the, the delivery of services uh, uh, that much more efficient and effective. So congratulations to you, uh, your staff, and uh, everyone involved in bringing us to this point.
quite frankly, as you indicated, I think there was uh, some feeling that it might ev never happen. <laughs> so, great job, folks. Thank you very, very much. Great job to uh, all of those uh, who uh, were recognized the, this morning. Uh, there's uh, one other uh, special recognition I'd like to uh, speak to this morning. Uh, on Sunday, uh, County Manager Hanna Zacharias was recognized with the Edwin O. Stein Award for Managerial Excellence. Uh, the Managerial Excellence Award is named in honor of Edwin, Edwin O. Stein, a retired political science professor at the University of Kansas, known in local government as the founder of KU's City Management uh, Focused Master's degree in public administration program, a noted program nationally and internationally. The uh, award recognizes uh, individuals who have performed in an exceptional manager in the management of the organizations in which they are employed. And uh, the award was given uh, at the Kansas University City Manager Alumni Organization Banquet, uh, which is a yearly event sponsored by KU at the International City County Management Association Annual Conference. So, Mr. Zacharias, congratulations. Thank you very much. And at this time, we'll turn to the public comment portion of our agenda. If there's anyone present who would like to address the commission on an item which does not later appear on the agenda, uh, you're, please come to the podium, the microphone, state your name and address, limit your comments to five minutes, and we'll be glad to receive that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brad Weisenberger. I'm the chairman of the Johnson County Airport Commission, 15329 Lake Road 2, Gardner, Kansas. Um, I'd like to read a statement that I put into the record at our Johnson County Airport Commission meeting yesterday morning regarding the Airport Commission's policy and our tenants regarding the industrial park and our uh, policy towards the lineage logistics development. The new century industrial park has been designated for industrial use since 1973 when the Olathe Naval Air Station turned over the property to the county, deeded from the federal government on November 19, 1973 to the county. We have just over 400 acres under long-term lease to nearly 70 industrial and commercial tenants, ranging from manufacturing, warehouse, distribution, regional office headquarters, and several Fortune 500 companies utilizing 3 million square feet of space and employing nearly 5,000 private sector jobs. Typically, we enter into leases for 20 to 30 years with options to extend. Most of the larger developments have leases with terms in the range of 50 and possibly more years. Through these land leases, the airport operations have been self-sufficient for over a decade. This means that no county tax dollars are used operating either of the county's airports. One of the airport's commission's prime role is to continue to grow our tenant base and expand our economic opportunities. One of our newest partners is Lineage Logistics, a cold storage facility. It will be a warehouse where frozen foods are stored and then distributed. It will not manufacture or process any chemicals. The, field, the facility will use anhydrous ammonia only as a, as a refrigerant 
in a closed loop system inside the facility to maintain the necessary level of cold temperatures. Anhydrous ammonia is commonly used as a refrigerant in similar facilities that store or process food and beverage products. It also is widely used in agriculture for growing farm crops. The Airport Commission began discussing the proposed lineage logistics facility in late 2016 and approved the option to lease the land to lineage on December 7, 2016. The Zoning Board considered a development plan for the facility and approved it on May 24, 2017 after a public hearing and recommended approval to the Board of County Commissioners. The BOCC discussed the plan in an agenda review session and again at a regular board meeting with public input, voting to approve the plan on July 6, 2017. There was an opportunity for the public comment at the Airport Commission, Zoning Board, and BOCC meetings. Lineage is just one of the many manufacturers we are working with to bring the New Century Air Center and are pleased to do so. Our efforts to have more companies here to further promote the benefits of Johnson County will continue to be part of the Airport Commission's role. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Someone else. Joanna Walker, 25088 West 150th Terrace. I am... Um, I had so much to say today, but I'm glad he just spoke because, wow, that is just so not true. In so many ways, I just need to say that. It's too, I have, don't even have enough time to talk about it. Um, as far as it just being used as a refrigerant, it doesn't matter. If the power goes out, it'll leak. Closed loop system, all of that, that's, he's gone. Once again, not listening to the public. So, um, I'm here, I brought my neighbor and her daughter. Once again, I'm here representing numerous neighbors who cannot be here because they're at work. Now, obviously, nobody wants this building because that's why the local and state representatives have come here to speak on behalf of the community. And I just want to thank those representatives for doing that. We really appreciate all of them. They actually are what we want in a representative, is to listen to the community, think of us and our safety. And the BOCC, that's what we want from you too. As far as I know, that's your job. Am I correct? And, you know, <laughs> I was so upset when I found out that the BOCC decided to let lineage in on the lawsuit. However, you objected to 300 plus new homeowners that just now found out about this being added to the lawsuit. Why is that? Why would you object to the community, the taxpayers, people that actually live where lineage will be built? Why would you say no to us, them? They're just now finding out about it. The word keeps spreading and spreading and spreading Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, Overland Park, Lenexa, you name it, people are finding out about this. So my preacher on Sunday said, he asked everyone if we wanted Bill Gates' um, bank account, if we could have it. Everybody smiled. He said, what if I told you right now that you could have Bill Gates' bank account? Please stand. He said, but what if I told you that you have to give up your relationship with God, everlasting life? Who's going to stand now? See, money is not worth selling yourself for. A building is not more important than the community or the citizens or the families and the children that you all are supposed to represent. I don't know why you're not listening to the community. We don't know why you haven't rescinded your vote and done what the Tonganoxi leaders have done. They listen to the community. You all can do the same. And I don't understand why you haven't. Nobody can. So we hope that you all will please show compassion and show the community that you do care and rescind your vote for Lineage Logistics. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Sharon Carroll. I live at 15555 South Moonlight Road. I did not come here today with the prepared notes, and I find it hard to read my own writing anymore, so bear with me. You have to be as tired of these weekly meetings as I am. But at the end of the day, when you go home, you will not have your peace and quiet, and we will be confined to the noise, the smells, and the danger of anhydrous ammonia that your decision has made. When you said, the gentleman came in and said that the airport had made all of these improvements and this type of thing, but it was still, when we bought our land, which backs up to New Century Airport, it was PEC3, not an 85-foot building, and not the dangers of anhydrous ammonia. I realize there are companies there that have the anhydrous there but already, but it, they're, they have a much better track record than lineage logistics. I've done a great deal of study on what all of their plants have done, including the one at Edwardsville. They have been cited. I don't want to live next door to that. I feel that you have taken exception with the people that live around that area. You've not considered their feelings or their welfare. So I'm asking you to please rescind your vote and think of the people that are affected by your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else. My name is William Joyce, or Bill, and uh, I live at 4806 Belinda Court, Westwood, Kansas. My subject is a small claims decision of the hearing officer for 2017. The hearing officer and county representative made numerous errors in the small claims hearing decision as stated below. The county has failed to comply with the order for the tax year 2009 by failing to make a one-step reduction in the property's physical condition, construction quality, and CDU, which raised from fair to average plus. The county has failed to comply with the order on reconsideration for the tax year 2009 for the value of 84000 $900 by increasing the value to 87300 in 2014 and to 92000 in 2015 and to 115000 in 2016 and 124900 for 2017. This is an increase of $40,000 or nearly 50% over the 2009 order on reconsideration. After 2009, the subject property had numerous damage which had decreased the value. In 2011, a one and a half foot diameter tree branch fell on the north side of the roof and side of the house and made only partial repairs were made. In 2012, a smaller branch fell on the back of the house and another on the south side with minimum damage. Also, during November, 2012, the taxpayer passed out making repairs on the back of the house and can no longer make major repairs on a ladder. In March 2013, the galvanized water line was replaced with copper or brass during 16 degree temperature and 17 inches of snow. The line had to go under a six foot by six foot storm sewer there is constant sagging of ground and a sidewalk. Uh, you see, that there's a sketch for, the, uh, for, for that. In September 2013, a strong wind knocked over one half of a 70-foot ash tree. That broke at one half of a maple tree and one-fourth of a gumball tree. A two-and-a-half to five-foot diameter stump remains 
which has no value. In, 2000, in July 2014, Google pierced the taxpayers' sanitary sewer line, and it took two weeks to find and then repair the sewer line, which made living miserable. Also, a shade tree had to be removed to make the repair. After three years, the front yard is only beginning to re be repaired because Google's repair produced weeds. This taxpayer requests that the first district commissioner suggest to the county appraiser that they come to view the subject property and then allow the taxpayer to drive in by several comparable properties as early as possible because taxpayer has to make has to file for a case with Topeka, which has been a lost call for a number of years. And then uh, the decision of the hearing officer, order of 2009. This has the values of the property, and it has also a sketch, pictures of the replacing of the uh, sanitary sewer line, and then. The, the uh, comparable sales report. That's all. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I'll go. Hi, my name is Gina Julian, 25156 West 149th Place. I live in Olathe. This is my sweet girl, Ashlyn. The whole linear logistics thing is concerning on multiple levels. For me, it's concerning because I have a teenager that drives. And I know that we've had fatalities out there. And I know that this is going to increase traffic on Old 56. And it's going to increase traffic in that area that we already have issues with. And I'm hoping that there's a plan already for that to help with the, with the issues that we have out there. But I'm also concerned as a parent in regards to not having somebody who can respond in time if there were something that happened. Um, my daughter had a trip to Children's Mercy two weeks ago and fire department can't respond for her in time. It's 20 minutes sometimes. And it is life threatening for her. She had an aneurysm that ruptured when she was two weeks old. For the record, you can Google her. She's super glue baby and you can Google her. Her last name is Julian. True story, she was on USA Today, the whole nine yards. Um, but if something were to happen out there, who can respond in a timely fashion? For us, we have to drive as quick as possible to get to Children's Mercy. But if there were an accident with linear logistics, which is possible, or any of the other facilities out there, who responds? We have a makeshift fire department right now down the street that's only manned 20, 24% of the time or less. How do we get somebody out there to take care of our families if something were to happen? There was a traffic fatality in front of our neighborhood a few years ago. A young man was killed on a motorcycle. We've had drunk driving accidents out there. We have the giant quarry trucks. I understand this is business, and I understand it's money, but we're families who live out there who would really like to see either rescind your vote for linear logistics until we have the infrastructure available to be safe for our community, or propose a plan that helps with that as well, that includes the fire department and includes the streets. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us into this chambers today. Uh, this is my first time. My name is Shonda Adams. I live at 1416 West Sheridan. Um, not far from Moonlight, the lady that spoke that's over there, uh, 10 Church at Prairie View. Um, I brought some things, but I didn't realize that I needed to get them to the clerk. This is my family. May I? Thank you. I believe I have enough. Uh, my husband and I have just solidified a, our second adoption for our two-year-old. Um, we have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And as you all make your decisions uh, on a daily basis for the county, um, I ask that you 
keep in mind our friend here and her daughter, uh, my daughters, and so many around us that have little ones. See, because long after some of you are expired, um, they will still be living here. And long after lineage uh, is done with Johnson County, there will still be um, possibly the carnage, the lint, you know, the uh, um, whatever they may be, uh, whatever may and, and could happen uh, over time. You know, votes are easily bought these days. We see it in Washington. It's, it's unreal. Uh, I do hope that uh, you will stay true to what you ran on um, and why you're in your position that you are in, quite frankly. I have visited actually with Mr. Resmond, uh, Mr. Dove, um, some of the city council uh, just this week actually and let Jana know about that. Uh, I'm also a small business owner, very small business owner. I'm actually the only employee as well as the owner, but uh, I'm here in Johnson County and uh, like that and I think we all do. You see it's not about the the um, actual materials, it's your track record with this company. There's there's really no consideration for those around. Um, if I could just take a poll, how many are in the five mile radius of the maximum evacuation zone? I don't see any hands raised on the other side of the bench. Is that correct? Correct. So, you see, you're making decisions and you don't even know our neighborhoods or our neighbors or our families. And so I implore you to rescind your vote. Um, I, to uh, remind, it, is Mr. Mike Brown here? Uh, incidentally, I don't, <laughs> I never like saw a lot of your faces. Uh, he had a conversation with an individual who I won't name because he's not here. He had prior obligations, but he does represent us. Uh, was there a plan for a Johnson County hazmat team to go along with the deal? Because that's what's going to be needed. Uh, because I'm not quite sure that our Olathe hazmat team would be able to respond in a timely manner should something happen. We all know how self-inspections go. We've lived through that as a nation. That's gone well. Uh, so were any of you going to be on the inspector board? Um, I urge you to do so if you decide not to rescind your vote. I personally would like to hear from the EPA. I would like to hear from some more folks. So I appreciate your time and I want you to know that. And truly I do thank you for allowing all of us here uh, in the chamber this morning. Please consider every vote that you make affects generations to come not just yours, not just mine, but my children's children. And when we look at things like this through the county, questions come to mind because we see it so often in Washington. The pay to play, the quid pro quo. Again, votes can be bought and sold, but officials and delegates are elected by the people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Bonine in uh, Copper Springs, 28570 West 159th. Um, I like, uh, I think Sharon mentioned that you guys probably hate coming to this and especially the, the public comments uh, section. Um, but again, I'm grateful that you have them. Overland Park doesn't have them at their city council any, anymore, and I hope that you don't ever change uh, this. You need, to, you need to hear from us whether you like or agree with what we uh, say. It's important, uh, even uh, though some of you should pay more, a little more attention to your people. Every Wednesday night, I hate looking forward to this, too. I can never go to sleep on Wednesday night because I'm sitting there wondering why 
this continues. Why you went with it to begin with, but uh, you can make a case for that. But after, after all that you've uh, heard in the in the past few months, um, and um, I, I just I just don't know why. Why do you keep after this? What is in it for you? Um, last last week at the end of the uh, oh, and by the way, the city manager kind of stole one of my lines today. I appreciate that you're talking about doing the right, doing the right things. Uh, that that's part of a, a quote I, I want to share here in a second. But um, last week at the uh, end, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, you uh, you uh, the several uh, spoke on behalf of politicians, and you said that uh, you would like to meet with them and uh, discuss how you arrived at this decision and everything. I thought, we've been asking these questions for months. Why do you want to meet with politicians behind closed doors, but you won't meet with us? Tell us. Why, why don't we have any uh, town halls uh, o over this? Why, why won't you come out and face the uh, public and tell us? You know, maybe we'd be in agreement with you. Uh, this, this is not, um, this is not good. Um, that you you want to meet with politicians, but not not the uh, people. Um, I appreciate this morning recognizing the uh, uh, the sheriff's department and the uh, uh, the officers there. I'm glad they're up to full uh, strength. That public safety is important. That's why a lot of us are here because we don't feel this is a uh, this is a public safety uh, concern. And uh, one of the comments uh, you made was that you recognized the group because they were looking for ways to assist those that we serve. And we feel like you're not looking for ways to assist us uh, whom you serve. And um, I like to say, I want to, uh, to uh, share a quote about the uh, difference between uh, managers and leadership. And... Um, this city manager, I, I think, got, uh, said that part. Peter Drucker said, management is doing things right. And several times over the months, you say, we did that, we did this right. And yes, you know what, what, uh, what uh, periods to put in and what, what uh, eyes to cross or whatever. Um, but it says, he goes on to say, leadership is doing the right things. Are you really doing the right thing for the people in Johnson County with this? Are we really getting a benefit that's worth what you're doing to the 800, 1,800 homes out there or, or whatever? It's not like you built this plant and then everybody wanted to move in right next door. We're already there. And yes, you have some property, but I would hope that there's other, uh, there's other businesses out there besides this who has, doesn't have a good safety record. But to put this uh, great big uh, building in there, this is not, this is not a new century, this is, this is old century. Why can't we get any technology jobs in, in there? Um, how hard did you work? Uh, and uh, when you started out, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one thing, uh, well, it's, it's development. Development is good and development is needed but at the expense of, of your uh, people, to put them at a, at a harm, even if it's a perceived slight harm by you all, um, no, it's not worth it. I just hope instead of, instead of uh, defending yourselves by saying we did things right, that you'll stand up and do the right thing. Thank you. Someone else. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Raby. Good morning, Tom Raby, 17513 West 113th Street. That's in Olathe. And I uh, haven't talked to you for a couple of weeks. Uh, this is the time of year when the sun angle is low. And if you drive east on your way to work, you know it. And you get behind those people who have put everything from uh, last year's tax receipts to uh, makeup kits 
above their sun visor and when they pull it down to block the sun from their eyes it all falls in their lap and you've got to panic and and uh, that's how accidents happen that's just as bad as uh, texting and talking on your cell phone when you're driving so watch out for that buy yourself a baseball cap pull it down over your eyes and use it to shade the sun I learned that many 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 years ago because I had to drive east into the Holland Tunnel in, uh, from New Jersey to New York for years. And speaking of New Jersey, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't, uh, I, I feel your pain for you folks out in uh, the western end of the county who uh, have an anhydrous ammonia condition, but I lived in New Jersey for 10 years, and you want to talk about exposure to petrochemicals, chemicals, and everything imaginable. And also I went through the Navy's nuclear power program, so uh, I'm not quite as, as uh, nervous about this uh, cold storage plant as you folks. And I'm not trying to, to downplay your concerns, but uh, there was a procedure, and hopefully you went through it. And if you went through it, then, uh, then it could be all done. I don't know. And I won't comment on the uh, merits of uh, lawsuits. Next week is Halloween. And after that is uh, El Dia de los Muertes. And uh, get ready, folks. And I'm not talking about any of you folks. The uh, so-called Halloween, or Halloween, <laughs> got it fixed in my brain. So-called holiday season has already started. Uh, you've got de Christmas decorations in uh, Oak Park Mall. And Target promised not to jump the gun on uh, Christmas uh, items, but they did. And Nordstrom's continues to not do Christmas items until after Thanksgiving, which I think is quite commendable. And speaking of Oak Park Mall, you know, uh, OPM could be other people's money. Or OPM could be the Office of Personnel Management if you're a federal uh, worker. But uh, to uh, talk about you know, acronyms and logos. I, I still think it's time for you folks to pay attention and put the county logo on one of these hats and I'll buy the darn thing. So start the online uh, gift shop now. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anyone else? All right, there being no one else to be heard, the uh, public comment portion of our agenda <clears throat> is concluded. For those who are interested uh, on the county's website, uh, a listing of questions that have been presented uh, in regards to lineage logistics uh, are posted there with uh, appropriate responses. So if anyone's interested, uh, that information uh, is available to everyone. We have no notes for the record this morning. Uh, would the clerk please read the proposed uh, consent agenda? Consider approving the October 5th, 2017 business session minutes. Two, consider ratifying the chairman's reappointment of James Vaughn as the mechanical engineer representative to the Board of Code Review through May 31st, 2020. Number three, consider approving of an interlocal agreement with the City of Overland Park for connectivity and fiber use for county facilities to connect to the Johnson County Wide Area Network. Number four, consider approving a 60-month agreement with Unite Private Networks to provide Johnson County dark fiber from the County Communications Center to neutrality properties. And number five, consider authorizing a renewal to the contract with Everbridge for the county's mass notification system for a period of five years and an annual cost not to exceed $175,215.
Is there any commissioner who would like to have an item considered separately? Is there anyone present who would like to have an item considered separately? If not, back before the commission, Mr. Osterhaus. Move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. Motions made and seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Klicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus. Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft. Yes. Chairman Eilert. Aye. Motion carried. Moving to the action agenda, item number six. Resolution number 072-17, conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the proposed 2018 action plan with estimated funding in the amount of $1,900,493, consisting of an estimated $1,080,000 in CDBG and $820,493 in home funds for housing and community development, close the public comment period, Consider authorizing the county manager to execute related documents and consider authorizing submission of the 2018 action plan for housing and community development to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development as recommended by the Housing and Community Development Advisory Committee. Mr. Schmidt, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Uh, Vicki Vicky Schmidt, Human Services Community Development. This public hearing is for the 2018 action plan for housing and community development. It concludes the 30-day public comment period, during which time staff received no written comments. I would like to request that after the closing of the public hearing that the board authorizes the county manager to execute the related documents to HUD. This plan is to inform HUD and the public of the intended uses of the 2018 funds and estimated results of recommended activities by the subrecipients. The action plan is submitted and presented in HUD's recommended format to comply with the federal reporting requirements. The BOCC priorities are included in the CDBG application handbook. <clears throat> For the 2018 written application, applicants were asked to explain how their proposed projects addresses the strategic priorities established by the BOCC. And then during the presentations in July of 2017, Applicants explain to the rating team members how their project meets one of the Johnson County strategic priorities and that is used as one of the scoring and rating criteria by the, house, by the rating team. As part of our outreach, staff attended the March 9th meeting of the Community Development Disabilities Organizations. Information about CDBG funds and the application process was reviewed along with the grant requirements, allowable costs, and the process and timeline of applying for CDBG funds. We shared the contact information for the entitlement cities of Lenexa, Overland Park, and Shawnee so that they would know who to contact for those if they were in those cities. The 2018 action plan has been made available since the public comment period was opened by the BOCC at the September 21st, 2017 meeting. Okay. Questions of Ms. Schmidt? All right. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, this is a public hearing, so if there's anyone present who would like to address the commission on uh, these recommendations, ask you to come to the podium, state your name and address, we'll be glad to receive your comments. No one? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering after nine years whether you're getting tired of my data. <laughs> Uh, my name is Valerie Carson. I'm from United Community Services of Johnson County, and we act as this county's um, lead agency, and we do project coordination for Johnson County's continuum of care on homelessness, for which CDBG funds are recommended to support. Um, we have been doing this since 2003, and the continuum is made up of 50 or more 50 plus organizations, depending on how you want to parse them, um, that are local here and, and include county and city level departments that are committed to working together to address poverty and end homelessness here in this county. Um, through working together and, and strategizing and choosing actions that we feel are moving us all towards common goals, um, funds are leveraged for housing and supportive services, and as a result, people who are experiencing homelessness or at risk for homelessness are able to regain and maintain stable housing. In these nine years, I have seen a large expansion by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development around the responsibilities of the continuum of, of care. Um, we are charged with developing and implementing 
a ho coordinated housing and service system that will end homelessness here in our county with special priority given to those who are veterans, those who have experienced long or repeated episodes of homelessness, those who are families that have children, and homelessness among youth and young adults. Um, as of January 2018, we will be also needing to establish and operate what's called a coordinated entry system to more efficiently and effectively connect those who are in a housing crisis with safe housing and prioritizing them based on vulnerability for the limited permanent housing options that we have available here in the county. To track our progress, to see whether we are doing what we need to do in order to end homelessness, we annually count the number of both unsheltered and sheltered households here in the county on one night in the last 10 days of January. In 2017, 130 persons were identified as homeless in Johnson County on one night, which was 23 less than in 2016. We continue to make progress in a downward um, trend in our overall numbers of homelessness. Where we struggle is that the numbers and the proportion of our overall homelessness for those who are unsheltered, who are living outside in tents, in abandoned buildings, in their cars, continues to go up. And the reason for that is that particular subgroup are households that don't have children, for which we do not have emergency shelter here in Johnson County. As in prior years, three out of four of our households surveyed reported that they had been physically, emotionally, or sexually abused by family members, and one in four report significant mental illness, and these are often a challenge to being able to maintain stable housing. All COC members providing housing and services must track this information, and we use this information as a COC to evaluate whether we're being effective, whether we're meeting the needs of our most vulnerable households, and then strategize for how to make modifications to how we deliver services in order to continue to reduce the number of overall homeless in the county. The COC is not only charged with addressing the needs of those who are currently experiencing homelessness, but also in putting systems in place that prevent households from becoming homeless. So, and if that loss of housing is unavoidable, to quickly return them to permanent housing and provide those kinds of services that will enable them to maintain that housing successfully. As a result, COC members and UCS as the lead agency coordinate with local governments and access existing mainstream resources to best serve persons' clients. Thus, we provide local input to the consolidated plan and develop partnerships with other HUD-funded programs such as local public housing authorities to meet the needs of clients. In 2018, we, um, we hope to expand our partnerships with public housing authorities to create more bridges to permanent housing options for our most vulnerable clients and additional partnerships to serve vulnerable populations in 2018 will include a recent award to Restart, Inc., who will now be um, creating an, a transitional living program for 18 to 21-year-olds here in Johnson County that are residents who are homeless or at risk for homelessness, often as a result of having aged out of foster care. Finally, each year UCS, as the COC lead agency and the COC members, submit a competitive grant to HUD for resources to serve Johnson County residents who are experiencing homelessness. In 2016, over $677,000 were awarded to local organizations to provide that housing and those supportive services. These funds are not only those amounts of dollars because they also leverage additional resources and they support local service providers offering permanent and transitional housing and related supportive services to households whose homelessness could not be prevented. It's, UCS very much appreciates how CDBG has been set aside and, um, and allocated for potential use for the Johnson County COC's um, staff support, because without these dollars, we would not have the ability to be able to do this work. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Allen. If I can, I was going to ask maybe one quick question. Mm -hmm. the, the date that you do the census in January, is that a date that's done across the country or a date that you select here locally? Or 
We are required to do it in the last 10 days of January, so it needs to be between the 21st and, um, and the 31st. We generally choose, it's kind of hard to say the date of the point in time because it's a night into the next day. I kind of thought that. I just personally, I thought if you here locally doing that, say, versus March, I didn't know the numbers, <laughs> but I had a feeling you were mandated in a we way. Ha we have to do it. We do very purposefully, though, coordinate with um, the other counties and over across the state line to do the same date so that if people move, we're not counting them twice. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Board of County Commissioners, good morning. Thank you for the time. I'm Jose Leon. I spoke with you a couple weeks ago. I'm the Director of Public Works uh, for the City of Roland Park, Kansas. Um, as a community that's participating in the CDBG program this year um, under this resolution, we are extremely supportive of the program and we thank you for your leadership in, in helping support us to uh, meet the county's goals. We're looking to improve some infrastructure in our community and um, we think we have a great project and we thank the staff especially for helping to administer this program for us so we're supportive and we just wanted to come here this morning and say thank you thank you good morning i'm janae hanslick and i am the president and ceo of safe home which is johnson county's domestic violence agency and Safe Home is part of the continuum of care on homelessness that Valerie referenced. We've been in Johnson County for 37 years, and we are an integral part of the public safety system. In fact, Safe Home, uh, we do have a 60-bed shelter that is for victims of domestic violence and their children, and we serve men, women, and children in that uh, facility, whether they come with children or they are single people. Uh, in fact, uh, it's been very interesting because uh, this year is my 20th year working at Safe Home. And when I started working at Safe Home 20 years ago, uh, one of our biggest challenge, challenges was convincing people that domestic violence was even a problem in Johnson County. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it has continued to be a problem. However, thanks to Safe Homes education efforts, as well as the partnerships with uh, the district attorney's office, the law enforcement, chiefs of police, health care providers, and Johnson County government, uh, we, we no longer have as much of a problem convincing people that domestic violence does exist here in Johnson County. Um, and so we've come a long way in 20 years. Uh, during Safe Home's 37 years of uh, operations, the services have expanded exponentially. Uh, in 2016, in fact, Safe Home provided face-to-face -face assistance to over 5,000 victims of domestic violence. That was a 23% increase from 2015. Also, in 2016, Safe Home's hotline responded to nearly 5,000 calls from victims and their friends and family members, which was a 41% increase over 2015. And finally, reflecting the diversity of our community, Safe Home served nearly 700 victims who identified themselves as Hispanic in 2016, and that was a 113% increase over the number of Hispanic victims served in 2013. So safe, the demand for safe home services has continued to grow. And part of those services, as Valerie mentioned, is we do provide a transitional housing program and a rapid rehousing program using uh, funding from HUD that allows us to help people trans, uh, transition out of the shelter into permanent housing in our community. One of the other things that I really am very excited to share with you is uh, Safe Home's critical role as a part of our public safety system. We've heard a lot of that mentioned this morning, and I have some good news <laughs> about that. Uh, 
you all, uh, I think, are aware that in July of 2011, uh, the Domestic Violence Lethality Assessment Program started here in Johnson County, and it is a collaborative, collaborative effort between the District Attorney's Office, law enforcement, including the Sheriff's Office, which I'm sorry they're, they're not here to hear this, uh, and Safe Home. And the purpose of that program is to reduce and stop domestic homicides by providing immediate access to safe homes support and services when law enforcement arrives at the scene of a domestic violence call. And this, this is the really important part of this. Uh, in 2011, the year that that program started, seven of the 11 homicides in Johnson County were domestic homicides. That was 64%. Since that time, the number of domestic homicides has continued to drop significantly. From seven in 2011 to five in 2012, and then in 2013 and 14 and 15, there were zero domestic homicides. We have never had that before in the county where there was three years without any domestic homicides. Unfortunately, there was one in 2016. It was a murder-suicide murder in Prairie Village. And then there was one so far this year, a murder-suicide in Olathe. And uh, unfortunately, none, neither of those victims had ever reached out to Safe Home. So we do have some work to do, but without question, Safe Home is helping save lives in this community. In 2013, Safe Home completed a capital campaign and major expansion to our shelter and our counseling capacity. With nearly 60 women, men, and children living in the shelter each day, it takes a toll on the facility and requires ongoing maintenance. Safe Home depends on community development block grant funding to help us maintain that facility. And we have uh, requested 2018 CDBG funds to allow us to replace uh, the aging and frequently broken, in fact, they're broken right now, commercial grade washers and dryers, and to replace seven of the 24 individual heating and cooling units uh, in each of the bedrooms in our shelter. So in conclusion, Safe Home is a critical piece of the public safety system in Johnson County, and our shelter and services save lives and increase the health and safety of this community and we are very, very grateful to the Board of County Commissioners for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, if I may, um, Janae is uh, moving on at uh, Safe Home, and I wanted to thank her for her 20 years of service. Uh, she mentioned many of the good things they do, and a lot of that happened under your leadership. So thank you for that. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Janelle Bowers. I'm with Friends of Johnson County Developmental Supports, and, and we've also been um, grateful for the health of the community development block that funds have helped us with, and, and of course all of you guys, and Vicki and Dawn, who help us with the application. I work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I think they're the most resilient and awesome people in the world, and I've loved doing it for the last 26 years. Please don't do math. Um, I started when I was two, or 19. Um, and what you guys do, what this grant does, is enables us to make housing possible. Johnson County is a great community, but your housing prices keep going and up and up, which is great for a tax base. Not so great for a person that makes $1,000 a month or less. And those of you who've... Um, had to hear me speak in the past and play the Monopoly game with me, which I'm more than happy to do anytime you'd like, know that that doesn't stretch very far when you have to pay rent and utilities and a client obligation that has to be paid back to the state for your HCBS funds. And what we do is, well, we take a house, 
We make it accessible. We make it so you can use the bathroom in your own house, which is kind of exciting. You can get down the hallway. You can go through the kitchen. You can make your own food because we've lowered a countertop or we've put a ramp so you can leave and come, as you go, as you would like. And that's what we do with the funds that you give us. And then with the rent that we charge, which is $325 a month, which I think is pretty reasonable for Johnson County, maybe a little bit lower than the norm, like by half. We take that rent money and we put in a special assistance fund, which makes it possible to get things like fillings or shoes, or maybe a little help with going to the gym to work on maybe an expanding waistline or making sure that you don't have to take di diabetes medication because we've helped you lose weight. And that's what we do. This year, we're approaching one of our houses. I started two years ago, and, and the thing that the board and I sat down and talked about was, what can we do better? What can we improve? We started some of these houses 20 years ago, and I think shag carpet was still a good idea. And we realized that it needs to be continuous flooring, so you're not making those transitions. Because as we get older, and individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities seem to age quicker, that transition from the flat floor to the cushy plush floor isn't a good idea. Going from a light flooring to a dark flooring is like walking off a cliff. Um, and so we put continuous flooring in. We realized that we didn't widen doorways enough to accommodate some specialized wheelchairs. And so we're going back through. And the rule of thumb that I've maybe forced upon people is what keeps you up at night and address that. So I go to work every day. What kept me up last night? Well, there's no ramp off the back of Agnes. That means there's only one access point. My other rule of thumb is what would embarrass my mother and don't do that. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> um, but it's doing all those things. And because of community development block grant funds this year, I guess, or last year, 17, we leveraged another $30,000 in grants from a private funder, another $2,000 from another funder. So you're a piece of a very big puzzle. And we're hoping December 28th that we'll get a phone call from a funder that will give us about $550,000, which is leveraged again because of community development block grant funds. So it's all part of a bigger picture that makes things possible for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that, you know, get up every day and do their thing despite people saying you shouldn't, wouldn't, can't, don't. And that's a resilience that I don't think all of us have. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? There being no one else to be heard, the public hearing is closed and the item is back before the commission. Mr. Allen? I would move to approve and adopt resolution number 07217, approving the proposed 2018 action plan for housing and community development with estimated funding in the amount of $1,900,493 in CDBG and home funding. Approve a submission of the 2018 action plan for housing and community development to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development and authorizing the county manager to execute related documents as recommended by the Housing and Community Development Advisory Committee. Second. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded to approve uh, the resolution and uh, the authorization as noted. Uh, is there any discussion or questions? Mr. Ashcraft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, over the past few weeks, I've had an opportunity to visit with uh, Ms. Schmidt and Mr. Thompson. And uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, Commissioner Click and I uh, visited with them further uh, on this topic. And over the last few years, Mr. Chairman, I have, uh, um, I'll use a very unscientific term, uh, fussed about the process. Um, not so much the, the needs or expectations, because I think they are valid, but what I continue to struggle with is the process. Uh, and again this year, I noticed that there is uh, funding allocated to one community uh, that at the same time has realized, uh, and they call it the IKEA dividend from sales tax increases and changes in uh, TIF revenues that have gone to them and that city also has been uh, spending uh, about $50,000 additionally in art. Now that is good for that community because they have learned how to work the CD Beach process. So what I have fussed the staff about is is looking at that process 
uh, so that the limited resources we have from this program can be focused on, um, not to pick on Safe Home, but um, why couldn't we put more money into Safe Home or like programs? And staff has indicated, and I think they've made some process changes, and I think Ms. Schmidt pointed those out, and I commend her and the review team for doing that. But she has indicated that she feels that um, uh, the county and maybe other organizations, local organizations, have their hands tied uh, by HUD and uh, policies and procedures that were created in a different time. And that, that has been a struggle. So the, one of the challenges we offered uh, or, uh, yesterday was uh, what might we do to engage our federal legislative members uh, and our, our local and national HUD representatives to look at this uh, and to look at flexibility so we can use those resources, uh, focus them on higher area of needs, higher community needs. And that, that was the conversation, and Mr. Thompson may want to elaborate on that, but my understanding is at one time, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the program, the HUD program, used to allow 30% of those funds to be used uh, for agency services, uh, but that was changed to be just 15%. Now, that's not necessarily good or bad, but what that is, Mr. Chairman, is that some federal bureaucrat in Washington 20 years ago decided to change it, and we have to try to work with that, and at some point, I would suggest that we as a community and maybe other communities in the region and maybe nationally should push back. And I, well, I mention this because my understanding is uh, Senator Moran is chairman of the subcommittee that oversees HUD and HUD operations. And we might have an opportunity to positively affect that. So I offer that statement and a suggestion. We might include that in our legislative platform as we go forward. Uh, and uh, we, we continue to support this, but we set the priorities that really focus on the needs of Johnson County and not, not some federal expectation that may or may not be relevant. So with that, I, I will offer I am supportive of this, but I, I, I still struggle with, with the um, allocation of some of these funds, but I understand that there has been progress made by staff, but I think we can make more progress if we, we, we think strategically. Terry. Well, let me make this, com this, this general comment. Uh, you know, in this county, there are communities that are designated uh, to receive their CDBG funding directly from the federal government. I don't recall there may be four or five cities who are in that category. Uh, and the county receives the CDBG funds for the other cities and agencies within the county. Uh, any expenditure of these funds have to meet specific uh, guidelines. And I know in the case of, of several cities, uh, those funds have been used for improvements in uh, neighborhoods that qualify uh, under, the, uh, under the HUD uh, guidelines. Uh, you know, your, your, your comments are well received. I would say this after listening to an interview of the Secretary of HUD a couple of days ago, I think the bigger issue is whether there's going to be any CDBG funds available uh, in the future or uh, how much might be available in the future, quite frankly. Fair Mr. point. Clicken. Mr. Clicken. Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, I, w I do want to compliment Vicki because I know that I know we've kind of tasked her to really take a look at uh, what we're doing here, and I appreciate the efforts that uh, that you've taken move forward. My my concerns hits, uh, comes from two different standpoints here. Number one, recognizing that these funds are allocated. Number one, I'll call it for infrastructure, public related, and it's probably about two thirds of the funding. Pardon me. 85% is tied to that, and then the balance is tied to, to various other programs. Um, on the various other programs, and I will refer to them more for agencies that are, are supporting some of the, the social needs here that we're wrestling with in our community, I wanted to make sure and uh, make sure that uh, staff was promoting, a, uh, promoting the funding of, of those projects. Um, 
to make sure that they were consistent with the overall county's objectives that we set up every year, one of them being homelessness and, and trying to promote self-sufficiency. So, uh, and um, in the future, being able to give us some, um, um, some what should I say, um, reinforcement that that's in fact what's being done. The second thing as far as dealing with the 85% tying back to our, our local communities that do not directly receive funding, um, CDBG funds, um, one of the concerns I've raised is, uh, especially in the smaller of the communities, um, how difficult it is for some of these staff people to get their arms around this and figure out how to make the applications, what's appropriate and so forth. Got the assurance pretty much from um, Ms. Schmidt and, and uh, Assistant County Manager uh, Thompson is that they are taking some steps to help open that up so they can help some of these communities reach out and and get the funds where their basic uh, some basic needs are, are are needed in those communities. So, I'm also very supportive of this program. Any other comments? All right, the motion uh, is before us. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Klicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus. Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft. Yes. Chairman Eilert. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you all. Thank you. Next item number seven. Resolution number WD 17-028, conduct a public hearing and consider authorizi authorizing funds to construct the Indian Creek 2 Contract 21 Sewer Capacity Improvements for Johnson County Wastewater in an amount to not exceed $6,165,000,000, I was staying corrected, $6,165,108.04. Increasing the total project authorization to six million six hundred two thousand one hundred and eight dollars and four cents. A billion here, a billion there. <laughs> this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Ms. Bakarik, uh, can you uh, straighten us out on that number? Yes, sir. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. I'd first of all like to thank Mr. Quish Chris Schneeweiss for increasing our budget to six billion. <laughs> We have many projects we can accomplish with that. No, actually, um, good morning. This funding request is for the improvements of a project known as Indian Creek Number no. 2, Contract 21. And the request is for $6,165,108.04, which is extremely important. Um, so this project is going to provide capacity enhancement uh, to an area upstream and downstream of the Meadowbrook redevelopment area, Meadowbrook golf course redevelopment area. Uh, it will provide wet weather enhancements as well as enhancements to capacity to serve that redevelopment of Meadowbrook. So up on the screen right now I have kind of an overall map of this project area. And on the map, uh, kind of give you some orientation. This this. Um, can you see? Oh, good. You can see the hand here. So the, the main uh, thoroughfare running here along the west side of the Meadowbrook redevelopment area, that's Knoll. And then along the east side, a little harder to see, is Row Avenue. The red lines represent the project, the capacity enhancements that uh, the wastewater project will provide. Uh, upstream, let me go ahead and zoom in here. Actually, let me stop for a moment so the capacity enhancements upstream and then downstream of Meadowbrook you'll notice here there's a break in the red line and that's because the green sewers through the area in this break have already been upsized as part of a project a flood project that the city of Overland Park did and so we were able to include the capacity enhancements we needed through that area in their project and that was completed by uh, VF Anderson um, construction let me zoom in a little bit. So this is upstream of Meadowbrook. Meadowbrook's down in the southeast corner. Uh, actually, this is the new par park property um, where they're going to be building a new um, park building there. And so this is Knoll, 91st Street. So we'll be making wet weather enhancements, or excuse me, enhancements of capacity to help service during those large wet weather events. And then we go downstream. You'll see the three ponds or three lakes here on the uh, old Meadowbrook golf course now part of that redevelopment area in the park and so the red line represents um, the uh, capacity enhancements and then on the very southern end 
We'll have capacity enhancements, and you'll notice Indian Creek runs along the southern end of the project. That's where our Indian Creek interceptor is, which carries all that flow over to the Tomahawk Creek wastewater treatment plant. <coughs> the, um, the board had previously authorized design funding for this project, and the design is complete, and we bid the project. Award of the construction contract is the next agenda item for your consideration. The refunding request here for six million one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars one hundred excuse me one hundred sixty-five thousand one hundred eight dollars and four cents includes construction and engineering construction phase services as well as an overlay of Royal Boulevard once the project's complete and we'll be utilizing Overland Park's mill and overlay um, program for that. Burns McDonald Engineering will provide the engineering construction phase services under the term supply contract they have with wastewater uh, that was selected through a competitive RFP process. This project was included in our capital improvement program that we presented as part of our uh, financial plan to you most recently here this summer. And we do recommend um, that the board approve funding for the project. Any questions? Questions. Okay, Susan, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a public hearing. If there's anyone present, uh, we would invite you to the podium uh, and receive any information on this topic. There's no one to be heard. Public hearing is closed. It's back before the commission. Mr. Osterhaus. I move the board approve resolution number WD 17-028, authorizing funds for the construction of Indian Creek 2, contract 21, sewer capacity improvements, and amount not to exceed $6,165,108.04, increasing the total project authorization to $6,602,108.04. Second. Motions made and seconded to approve the resolution as noted. Is there any further questions or discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Klicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus. Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft. Yes. Chairman Eiler. Aye. Motion carried. Next item. Invitation for bid number 2017-068. Consider authorizing a contract with V. F. Anderson Builders, LLC, to construct Indian Creek 2, Contract 21, Sewer Capacity Improvements in the amount not to exceed $4,759,106.04. Ms. McCary. Uh, good morning, Susan Pickerick with Wastewater again. This request for contract award for the Indian Creek 2 Contract 21 project um, was described under the previous agenda item. The bids for the project were opened on August 29th. We received four bids. The low bidder was VF Anderson Builders, LLC, in the amount of $4,759,100. I keep messing this up. Chris and I have the same problem today, $4,759,160.04. VF Anderson did complete, as I mentioned under the previous item, this little gap here in the, in the red lines for the whole project. They did complete the uh, upsizing along the um, Monitor Square flood project, as I had described under the previous item. The funding was approved under that item. Burns McDonald Engineers has reviewed the contractor's bid and qualifications. VF Anderson has confirmed they're comfortable with their bid, and the staff recommends award of the contract. Again, this is the companion item to the action that we just taken. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Ashcraft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, yesterday I had an opportunity to visit with Ms. McCarrick on this, and I appreciate her offering some elaboration on uh, this item. I was looking at it because the, the bid from V.F. Anderson was, um, well, from my vantage point, uh, significantly less than the others. And um, in the analysis, <coughs> it indicated that uh, Burns and McDonald had recommended award to this group. But then when I looked at Burns and McDonald, McDonald's uh, letter, the, one of the things they said that uh, just gave me pause was that they, they checked the project references and indicated that they were generally positive. So I engaged Ms. Pekarik in some conversation on this uh, because the, the actual recommendation was not as direct as I was comfortable with, but as she's pointed out in her presentation, the county has uh, uh, successfully worked with VF Anderson uh, recently, as she has pointed out, and, and has been satisfied. So I, I even though I have uh, uh, 
questions about um, the veracity of this recommendation, I respect uh, Ms. Pekarik's perspective and will be supportive of this. Thank you. Is there anyone else present who would like to uh, speak to this issue? If not, it's back before the commission. A motion would be in order. Mr. Clickton? I just had it here a moment ago. Um, I move that the Board of uh, County Commissioners authorize a contract with uh, VF Anderson Builders, LLC, to construct Indian Creek 2, Contract 21, sewer capacity improvements in an amount not to exceed $4,759,160.04. Second. Per invitation to bid number 2017-08068. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to uh, award the contract uh, as noted uh, and recommended. Any further questions or discussion? I just want to understand the four cents. <laughs> All right. There being none, clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Clicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus. Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft. Yes. Chairman Eilert. Aye. Motion carried. Next item. Resolution number WD 17-030, conduct a public hearing and consider funding the equipment purchase for SMTC contract 39A, Turkey Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility Clarifier Equipment Repair Project located at the Nelson Complex in an amount not to exceed $672,524. There's a public hearing. The public hearing is open. Ms. Bacarek. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioner Susan Pickerick with Wastewater. Uh, this funding request is for the purchase of clarifier equipment at the Nelson Complex uh, for the Turkey Creek facility there. So a little bit of a history lesson. They, and um, this is I-35 running along the northern portion of the map. And this is the Lamar Avenue uh, exit. And um, the Nelson Complex is actually two wastewater treatment plants that are co-located on the same property. The e generally northeastern portion of that property is the Mission Main Wastewater Treatment Plant. It serves portions of the Rock Creek and Brush Creek uh, service areas, and it's our original wastewater treatment plant in our system. It dates back to 1947. I think the original permit dates to 1945. The south, generally south and western portion of the treatment facility is the Turkey Creek Treatment Facility, and it dates back to 1959, and it, it generally serves the Turkey Creek um, service area. In the, and so that is outlined here by this yellow box. Inside that yellow box, you'll see two red boxes. Those are where our primary and our final clarifiers are located. And so they remove solids from the process at the beginning, when the wastewater first comes to us, and also at the end before it leaves us after, and it gets disinfected before dis, discharging back into the creek. Um, the equipment here is at the end of its useful life. It's really critical to have this equipment. Uh, it's essential to the process, as I mentioned, as well as to helping us meet our permit requirements. This funding request in the amount of $672,524 is for the pre-purchase of the equipment due to the long lead time. And so we want to go ahead and advertise that equipment um, and then we will later advertise here in the next month a project to install the equipment. That way we'll shorten the overall schedule of the project. Uh, I should note that the funding request um, or the funding amount was updated or corrected after um, last week's agenda after Commissioner Ashcraft brought that to our attention. And so that funding amount, the correct funding amount is the $672,524. The contract award for the equipment supplier is the next agenda item. And if the board approves the funding, we'll return at a later time for the board to approve funding and contract award for the installation contractor once we've received the bids. This project was included as part of our capital improvement program and financial plan we presented to the board earlier this year. We do re recommend uh, approval of the funding. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Mr. Ashcraft. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Ms. McCarrick, j just kind of a historical context, the, you mentioned that the permits were issued in 45, 1945 and 1959. That predates the EPA, so was that like a state permit that issued? Yeah, there's, a, there's actually, well, there was a water pollution law that's been in place since the 1950s. 
And then uh, Congress took that water, existing water pollution law and they updated that in the 70s with the Clean Water Act. Well, those were federal. And then the EPA was created with the Clean Water Act, right. Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. We can thank President Nixon for that. You can. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Again, this is a public hearing. If there's anyone present who would like to speak to this issue, would invite you to the podium. There being no one to be heard, public hearing is closed and uh, the item is back before the commission. Mr. Schaefer. I move to the board, of, the board adopt resolution number WD17-030, authorizing funds for the equipment purchase for SMTC contract 39A. Turkey Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility Clarifier Equipment Repair Project located at the Nelson Complex in amount not to exceed $672,524. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the resolution uh, as noted. <coughs> Any further questions or discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Clicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus. Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft. Yes. Chairman Eiler. Aye. Motion carried. Next item, item number 10. Invitation for bid number 2017-058. Consider authorizing a contract with Brentwood Industries Incorporated for the purchase of equipment for the SMTC Contract 39A Turkey Creek Wastewater Treatment Facility Clarifier Equipment Repair Project located at the Nelson Complex in an amount not to exceed $600,870. Ms. Bacari. Good morning, Susan Pickerick with Wastewater again. So this item is for the contract award of the clarifier equipment as I had described under the previous agenda item. Uh, bids to provide the equipment were open on September 28th. Brentwood Industries was the low bidder in the amount of $600,870. HDR engineers, had, who is our uh, design engineer, consultant engineer for this, they've reviewed the low bid and they recommend awarding the contract to Brentwood Eng uh, Industries and the staff does, we do, agree with that recommendation. Questions? Mr. Ashcraft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Picard, could you elaborate a little bit on the um, FDR comment that in our opinion the deviations from the specs do not impact Brentwood's bid? What, what, what does that mean? Uh, essentially, so we would issue a set of specifications for uh, the equipment suppliers to provide us a bid and um, so they provided some comments that um, Perhaps, and I'm sorry, I don't know, have the specifics, but they provided some comments where they may not provide exactly what was specified, and so those comments, each year found those comments to be minor enough that they still recommend that Brentwood, they feel that Brentwood provided a responsive bid and they can provide the equipment that was specified. You do not have any concerns that the, the um, deviations offered Brentwood in any way gave them an advantage in the bidding process over E Evo Evo Q Evoqua, uh -huh. Evoqua. Okay, what you said. That's correct. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone present who wish to comment on this item? If not, it's back for the commission, uh, Mr. Schaefer. Another. Uh, I move that the Board of County Commissioners authorize a contract with Brentwood Industries Inc. for the purchase of equipment for the SMTC contract 39A. Turkey Creek Wastewater Treatment Facilities Clarifier Equipment Repair Project at the Nelson Complex in an amount not to exceed $600,870 per invitation to bid number 2017-058. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the bid as uh, recommended. Any further questions or discussion? There being none, clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Clicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus? Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft? Yes. Chairman Eiler? Aye. Motion carried. Next item. Resolution number 085-17. Consider approving general obligation bonds to be issued by the governing body of Consolidated Fire District number 2, Northeast Johnson County, in the maximum principal amount of $6,500,000 to finance the acquisition, construction, and equipping of a fire station at or about 7810 Mission Road, Prairie Village, Kansas. Mr. Lynn. Mr. Chairman, Rick Lynn with the legal department. 
Uh, pursuant to state law, the governing body of a fire district in Johnson County shall have the authority to issue bonds if approved by this body. Uh, pursuant to KSA 19-3601B. That statute authorizes fire districts in Johnson County to issue bonds subject to the fire district having first provided published notice of its intentions to issue the bonds and the absence of a valid uh, petition having been filed in protest of the bond issue. If a valid protest is filed, it does require and triggers the calling and holding of an election. Uh, furthermore, at no time may the aggregate amount of the outstanding bonds issued uh, for a particular fire district exceed 5% of the assessed valuation of any tangible uh, property within the district. Uh, in November of last year, the governing body of the fire district adopted a resolution which authorized the public sale of $6,500,000 of the general obligation bonds. The bonds are being issued to finance the acquisition, construction, and equipping of a fire station located at about 7810 Mission Road. The bonds will be for a term of 20 years. From the information provided by the fire district, it does appear as if they have uh, preliminarily met the statutory requirements uh, for this bonding. Uh, they published notice. There has not been a uh, protest petition filed with the election office, and the amount of the bonds do not exceed 5% of the total assessed valuation in the district. Uh, a resolution has been drafted for your consideration, which recommends approval of the bonds, but I do know there are representatives of the fire district and bond council here who may wish to address you. Okay. Uh, if those representatives would like to address the commission, I would invite you to the podium. All right. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to address the commission on this item? All right, there being none, any questions of Mr. Lynn? Mr. Sure. Reichcraft, or the fire district staff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, j just to, this says fire station number 23. How, how, how many fire stations do you have? I mean, is that, is that, some, is that some grand numbering scheme or? You know, I don't know if that's a typo or a correct number. It's a correct number. So they're chief. Yes. Yeah, so so they just every time you build a fire station, you just add a number to. I, Tony Lopez, fire chief of Consolidated Fire District Number Two, and um, that we're a county system, sir. And so we're the twenty series. So we have three stations: twenty-one, twenty-two, and twenty-three. Oh. We'll have we'll have uh, of course four stations after this is done. Um, However, you know, the, all our neighbors are also a series. Um, Overland Park is a 40 series, so their stations are numbered consecutively. And um, Olathe, 50 series, and on. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Chairman. Uh, one follow on, Mr. Chairman. Um, this site makes a lot of sense in terms of coordinating with the community, and I commend you for that. I just wanted to check. Uh, in terms of the coordination with uh, uh, contiguous fire districts, in terms of location and placement, is there some kind of coordinated approach to make sure fire stations are, are spread apart far enough to maximize service delivery? Do you understand what I'm asking, Chief? Yes. Pr primarily, we're, we're looking to, to serve, you know, the communities that, that we're, the, the eight communities, the eight cities that we serve. And with that in mind, uh, we're usually within within a, a reasonable distance to our neighbors, which, of course, we have an automatic aid agreement with. So there is some consideration taken in that. Other questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Glickham. Chief, just uh, this, uh, the layout, the design of this fire uh, station seems to be very similar to the one that's uh, way on South Metcalf in uh, District 2. Is that uh, pretty close, square footage and everything? Square footage is approximately 15,000 square feet. We have a two and a half. How's that compared to Chief Francis' uh, operation on it, the new it's, one? It's very similar. Very similar. I believe he's got more administrative uh, offices in his where ours won't. Okay. Because we're going to keep our administrative offices where they are at 63rd and Mission. Part of this cost is the cost of the land mm -hmm. and, and site development. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? All right. Uh, Mr. Schaefer. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to commend the fire district for uh, persevering for all the uh, false starts and the real starts, and we're so glad that this has finally come come to pass. And I'd like to make a motion, if I may, sir. Sure. Fine. I move to adopt resolution number 085-17, which approves general obligation bonds to be issued by the governing body of Consolidated Fire District Number Two, Northeast Johnson County, in the maximum principal amount of six million five hundred thousand dollars to finance the acquisition, construction, and equipping of the new fire station at or about 7810 Mission Road, Prevoids, Kansas. Second. Motion has been made, seconded to approve the resolution. Any further questions or discussion? Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Schaefer. Aye. Commissioner Allen. Aye. Commissioner Klicka. Aye. Commissioner Osterhaus. Aye. Commissioner Ashcraft. Yes. Chairman Eiler. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Is there, are there any other items? No, sir. All right. Moving to reports and communications, Mr. Zacharias. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Three items this morning. First of all, is the City of Shawnee Redevelopment District, which is the Westbrook Village Shopping Center located at 75th and Quivira. Uh, they passed a resolution October the 9th uh, requiring or developing a redevelopment district, and they'll be conducting a public hearing on November the 13th at 7 o'clock. You have a copy of the resolution in your packets of this area. A footnote, this is going to be a potential tax and finance district project, so were you to go ahead and make any decisions that indeed there is an adverse effect on the county by creating this district, you could indeed put together a resolution stating so by November the 9th. So this is a 30-day clock period here should you want to weigh in, just a matter of information. And the information that we have is in your packets here as we go forward. There are no projects right now in the, in the uh, let's say for the district, but this is creating the district that allows projects to occur in the future. Second item you have in, with Sable Leith is industrial revenue bonds located at 167th Street uh, and basically Lone Elm in the northwest intersection of this uh, this area, northwest location of this intersection, looking at $121 million in industrial revenue bonds uh, for this project uh, with 10-year abatements, 50% tax abatements uh, for um, um, warehousing facilities primarily. And you have a cost-benefit analysis in your packets that talks about uh, the payback to the county over the 10-year period. <clears throat> Lastly, you'd ask us for information about uh, some uh, updates on cost-benefit analysis uh, activities. We did visit with Wichita State University, and uh, they indicate that they have done some review of projects after, been, after they've been completed, but those projects have been limited to whether or not the clawbacks that were required were actually put in place or necessary at that point in time. Um, and they we relied upon they relied upon the information from the actual uh, company to verify those numbers. Uh, otherwise, they've not really been asked to go ahead and, and do studies uh, that re reconfirm and whether or not to verify true up the cost benefit analysis that was done previously. Uh, nor has Siri been asked to go ahead and do those activities. We've been con contacting or talking with Mid America Regional Council, and I don't think we've heard back. Uh, but I don't believe they've done that kind of work either. So I just wanted to close the loop on that uh, question that uh, Commissioner Ashcraft i brought forward a few weeks ago. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Questions, Mr. Ashcraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Zacharias, uh, the term clawbacks, could you elaborate on what that means? Yes, oftentimes uh, what we'll, uh, communities will do is put in a provisions that say that uh, in order to get these continued the tax abatements, you are required to maintain a certain number of jobs or a certain amount of dollars per job. Uh, so if you don't, then indeed they're going to claw back those provisions. You don't get as much tax abatement as was offered. So, so there was an analysis done, uh, or at least that on some projects? On some projects, that's correct. Is that public information? That I don't know. I'm not sure if Chris asked the question, so I'm not sure. Uh, I did not ask if it was public um, information, but I'd be more than happy to reach back out with them and find out. Well, I'd be interested at least generally how often and what the track record was. If they've got a, a report, I, I'd be very interested in that, please. I'd, I'd be glad to do that. My experience in previous situations that cities that, that do that kind of activity monitor it pretty carefully to make sure those provisions are adhered to. Uh, but that's, uh, I don't know if that's public, I don't know. That's been my experience. That it's public? Huh? That it's public, you mean? Well, but it's, it's done. The public information, and uh, the cities are the ones that uh, go through the verification process, whatever, whatever those requirements are. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you. Uh, Julie Highfill. Third quarter interim financial report.
Good morning. Julie Heifel, Treasury and Financial Management. And I have some numbers for you, and I think I have nearly cleared the room in <laughs> anticipation of this. Oh, well, we're still hanging in there. I, uh... I'd like to thank the commissioners for allowing me to present one of our routine financial reports today that um, allows us to take a mid-year look at revenues and expenditures and update you on those. Um, I can say that the county's finances are in excellent condition and that both revenues and expenditures are tracking with their budgeted projections. So this one comes to you twice a year and we time it uh, so that after the second and third quarters we can give you this uh, information because we've had enough of the year happen that uh, we, we can start to observe some trends and if there would be anything that need to be adjusted you'd, you'd have the opportunity to do that. Um, this also allows us to connect with the public for those who are listening in and who might tune in later and have some interest. People, people like to know about our finances and uh, some of them just can't wait for the CAFR once a year. So here we are um, with an update and thank you. Just, just a reminder, unaudited, we want to turn these numbers around quickly for you so any, any tweaks that wouldn't be necessary would happen with the annual audit process. Um, and also for the public um, who may not be familiar with the format of the reports, we, pre we prepare four schedules of numbers, a revenue, two expenditure, and a cash balance, and uh, we add narrative commentary about those numbers. Um, the print is too tiny for me to put up on the screen here for anyone, so I, I do invite uh, anyone to, in the public to go out to our website and check Treasury and Financial Management. Uh, where our accounting reports are, if you're interested in those finer details. Um, one other reminder, there are no parks and recreation numbers in, in these reports. So the good news is this is a very short presentation today. I have no concerns to bring to your attention, and I'm just going to quickly go through a few highlights. Um, when we talk about the revenues, I can imagine that your question might be, does it look like our 2017 revenues are going to meet our needs to operate the government? And yes is the answer to that. You've seen, you've seen the schedule. The two main categories that we rely on to run this government are the property tax and the sales tax. <clears throat> and both of those are tracking with their budgets. In fact, sales tax slightly ahead of budgeted projection. I have a question right here. Sure. On the April Borum uh, tax. We budgeted uh, year-to-date 206, three, uh, 206 uh, let's see, 206 million three hundred and three thousand four hundred and eighty-three dollars correct? Am I reading this right? Yes. And year-to-date, we, we got in 206, 471,750 dollars, correct? Yes. Who gets a gold star for projections? That would be our budget office. That, that's phenomenal how close that is. Yes. And it purely on the mark. I, it's almost unbelievable that it's that close. So I just, whoever definitely de needs yeah. a gold star on that one. But I'm sure they're, sorry li about the they're listening in and, and I'm sure appreciate that very much. Tom, Tom Franzen, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just dead okay. Numbers. Where was I? Where was I? We're short on time. Listening in, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so just to finish with revenues, the other major categories are also listed on your schedule, and um, and they are also tracking with their budgets. So we we have good news on the revenue side. Um, talking about expenditures, we. Um, I, we prepare two reports. One is strictly the general fund, and the other and the other budgeted funds are on a separate schedule. And the purpose of those reports is to alert you if there should happen to be any unexpected spending or budget shortages. And I'm happy to say there are none. We looked at each department, and throughout all funds, they are tracking their their spending is under budget in total, and and almost across the board. Uh, individually by department. So uh, I checked in with a few departments to, to see, um, and there are various reasons for some of these expenses that haven't rolled through yet, but will in the fourth quarter. Um, 
We have full employment in the sheriff's office. I would expect to see all of their budget expended by the end of the year. And, but my sense is throughout the departments, we will be looking at being on budget, if not under budget, in the expenditure category. So again, that's good news. And finally, Schedule 4. Uh, this shows all of our cash balances in the non-budgeted and uh, capital improvement type funds that you all are responsible for deciding what, what should be done with those funds, either through going through this board or going through the CIP process. And so for the public, that's also maybe of interest to see where our monies lie for uh, current and future projects. And those are my remarks for today, unless you have other, other questions. Other questions. All right. All right. Very good, Julie. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our uh, reports and communications, so we'll turn to uh, Commission comments. Uh, Mr. Osterhaus. No comments. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Allen. Uh, just one quick one. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I had the opportunity with uh, Commissioner uh, Ashcraft and, and Maury to uh, attend the veterans' uh, graduation for the Veterans Court. Very impressive. Uh, the two individuals uh, have really uh, made a positive step forward and was really impressed with the collaborative effort and uh, the mentors that are involved, but uh, it was a very good program. Johnson County, again, is the only county in the state that's uh, currently offering that, so was very impressed with it. Very good. Mr. Ashcraft. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I was not going to raise the matter of protocol, but I do want to make sure that it's publicly recognized that you have an important event coming up this Sunday, so happy birthday, sir. Well, you know, everybody should have the opportunity to celebrate a 49th birthday. <laughs> and they also say when dreamers ever, live when, forever. <laughs> whenever it occurs. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Chair. Mr. Klicka. Nothing. Thank you. Mr. Jaffer. Thank you, thank you Ed, and happy birthday. Um, he was here a little earlier. I wish he were still here, but uh, Jose Leon came to the podium to speak about our, our HUD grant. But also, he was just recently awarded from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce um, the, get the name, Richard Barrera Award from the Greater Kansas City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for activities he's performed for the city of Roland Park as their uh, director of public works. He's been with Roland Park since 2014, so we want to congratulate him when we see him, okay? Number two, another, another Roland Park issue, uh, I had, was I'd invited to and attended the, um, they had a public meeting and sponsored by Keith Moody, the city manager of uh, Roland Park. He was here as well with uh, Mr. Leon. Aaron Witt and um, Susan were there. They discussed the uh, wet weather events and the wastewater BUPP program, as well as Cindy Serco and her crew were there with Kansas City Power Light talking about uh, lighting failures in the past wet weather experiences. It was a very good event and very knowledgeable. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. That uh, does conclude our uh, regular uh, agenda. Uh, we will take a short recess and come back for agenda review. Then we have a PBC special meeting agenda review also, uh, which involves the courthouse for anyone who's interested in uh, uh, receiving that information. So we are adjourned. We'll take a very short break and come back for agenda review. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair.